But you said something uh, that I found really striking, and I, I actually don't remember whether it was in a, a television interview or an article or maybe even a conversation we had, uh, where you said that kind of deficit uh, obsession is, first of all, it's a misalignment, as I think we've established in this conversation, as you've established, the report established, between a very small sector of society and uh, really the broader base of Americans, not just, uh, you know, working, lower-income Americans, but really even a very broad middle class uh, of Americans mm -hmm. that are, you know, facing this jobs crisis and this kind of anemic economy. Uh, but you've said that this deficit per obsession is also about a real fear of democracy. And I just think that's fascinating because if you look in the Eurozone, this austerity budget, you know, deficit fetishism is much clearer in terms of the sort of anti-democratic tendency because you basically have Eurozone ministers imposing these really uh, harsh budgets on, you know, places like Greece or Spain. That's very explicit. In America, it's less direct in a certain sense. It's more like these kind of more kind of complicated and delayed processes like the sequester uh, and things like that. But at the same time, through both the obsession uh, with the, the wrong issue to begin with and then locking ourselves into these agreements that delay our ability to really respond and anticipate to what the actual crisis is, you're seeing this real, what you call the real fear of democracy and the future. And I'd just love for you to get into more of that uh, idea with us now. Sure. Um, I think this was actually on Up With Chris Hayes that, that I, uh, I said that. It okay. was... Um I mean, basically, you're right. I mean, I think it's a it's a really great example to show how it's this vastly undemocratic what's going on in Europe, and that you really have sort of bureaucrats from other countries right. dictating the terms of of your own country's budget. But here, I mean, it it is similar in the sense that you've got elected officials who may be your representative in Congress or the Senate, but who are fundamentally beholden to someone other than the vast majority of their constituents, which is the donor class. Um, and we had about 40 years of a mounting um, economic conventional wisdom that basically broke with the financial crisis of 2008. Mm -hmm. The inequality era sort of collapsed in and on itself, and we had the orthodoxy that said that regulation was bad, that taxes needed to be low, and that capital needed to have all of the power in our shared sort of economic ecosystem really, really show itself to be deeply flawed, not just in terms of measurements of how well most of the country was doing between the gap between wages and productivity, the stagnating incomes at the middle and declining at the bottom while they were skyrocketing at the top, all of that, but then actually showed that it was terrible for capitalism itself. Right. There was an incredible opportunity for a realignment politically coming out of the financial crisis, and I do believe that um, the people who had been calling the shots for a very long time became terrified of what that would mean, um, became terrified of the idea of the kind of economic realignment that happened after the first gilded age in this country and after the resulting crash, where we really did do a new economic order and a new paradigm. And as long as this paradigm, which is one that puts that tolerates and, in fact, encourages inequality, one that is deeply unresponsive to what keeps working families up at night, the rising cost of college, uh, job quality, um, child care, you're going to have the potential for a well-functioning democracy to make huge changes. And so it is very scary for, you know, to use the simple word, the plutocrats, to think that we would have a responsive democracy where the desires of people to see a real realignment in our economy and a real government response to these pressing economic issues um, could just happen. And so the only way to tie the hands of that are, A, to make sure that the campaign finance system um, becomes less and less regulated so that the the big money continue, can continue to flow to shape the agenda in Washington, but also to put a fiscal straitjacket on what could be the government's response. 
I mean, if you look at all these debates around what percentage GDP there can be in government spending, you know, that's all a number. It's 18, it's 20, it's 21. But each percentage of GDP represents something that could be a real game changer for working families, right? So it's like half a percentage point GDP for um, free college, right? Right. You know, another right. third of a right. percentage point GDP for universal child care, really, truly universal child care, right? So deep for, you know, deeper, more more robust retirement um more robust retirement for the government to pick up that tab since employers have been walking away from that obligations and pension security. So these are the type of things that could be on the table if we had a more responsive democracy. So when I say that there's a fear of democracy, um, it really is about the people who have been calling the shots for the past 40 years being very afraid that the effects the shots that they have called, um, the effect of having such a stacked deck are going to really awaken uh, a democratic polity that's going to demand a lot more. And the only way to make sure that doesn't happen is to keep us in this austerity uh, straitjacket. Right. No, and I, I just have to say parenthetically, I like that you say that plut- plutocrats is the polite word or civil word. I thought that was... <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Um, so do, do you think, though, just a sort of one uh, kind of addendum on this question, there's this idea of – so there's the the money and the special interest component, obviously, and we're going to, of course, elaborate on that further. But then there's this other idea that uh, I think it was Simon Johnson um, – who's at MIT, I think, kind of, he wrote a book in, about the financial crisis, and he said also had this notion that there's the idea of kind of like cognitive capture in the Washington and policy class, that part of it is there is this kind of corruption of special interest money, but there's also just this inability to think outside of these really, really narrow uh, policy uh, initiatives and frameworks that people have been operating out of for decades. So even as the kind of overwhelming empirical evidence comes in that it doesn't work, that there's a serious problem, uh, that people still cannot kind of access a different way of thinking. Uh, What do you think of that way of looking at it? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a major part of it, particularly when it comes to regulators and people who are not theoretically, you know, raising campaign funds, although, of course, they are looking for the next job when they leave office, and so often it is a revolving door to industry. Um, A lot of it has to do with um, the lobbying that happens, and, you know, I mean, I've I've had many regulator meetings, and I know that I am I and my colleagues are the only people who are coming in for weeks at a time who are not saying, you know, you need to really go easy on the firms to make sure that there's still liquidity and these regulations are onerous. So right. it's, it's like when the politicians are calling through donor lists, if you're really hearing all the time, it's very well-educated, well-dressed, powerful, and rich people saying that if you – act in what is the broad public interest, you will crash the economy and you will be, you know, sort of excoriated as one of the, you know, sort of stupid Luddites. Right. That, that does have an impact <laughs> on, your, on your worldview. So we definitely have um, that issue. And I think it, it's also very hard when you think about sort of Washington as a place mm. and how much the sort of professional lobbying and sort of... Um, you know, for for defense, it's the defense industrial, but also just sort of like the regulatory industrial uh, influence peddling class that surrounds itself in Washington comes from, a, you know, a very narrow slice of the American people. And there is a conventional wisdom, and it is fundamentally conservative, even if people do have sort of liberal tendencies on various issues. It's fundamentally conservative in, in the sort of classic sense of the term, in terms of uh, conservative of, uh, against change, and very um, dis- disapproving of, of radical notions that would really disrupt the day-to-day. Because the status quo is really fine in Washington. Right. That's the problem, right? right? There is not a lot of economic pain among the people who are setting policies. And they don't see a lot of economic pain. I mean, the, the capital has been booming. Um, right. And so it's really hard to think I would leave the I would set aside the rules that are creating this status quo because something else is really urgent um, when there's really just, frankly, a, a bit too much comfort. 
um, among our policy elite. Right, and a, and a certainly a kind of lack of empathy and humanizing uh, outside of those really narrow confines. <laughs> 